I want to talk to you today about how you can make your research org more strategic by calling out eight things you can start doing now to position you and your team in a way that drives more impact and has your colleagues and collaborators coming back for more. Earlier in my career, I had the opportunity to build a games user research program from the ground up. The first thing I did was implement tools and processes that allowed us to do lots of evaluative research. Things like playtesting, um, lots of usability studies, and every game was like a scientific specimen to be prodded, picked apart, and studied deeply. I knew there was more to user research than getting caught up in these evaluative cycles that, at times, only delivered incremental improvements. Evaluative research is certainly important, but as I like to say, it's only one tentacle of the octopus. A strategic research organization helps design and development teams see all of the possibilities. I knew there was more that we could be doing. We would run playtests after playtests, wishing that we could have been involved earlier. As our team grew, we were able to stop wishing and start doing some real design strategy work. Okay, so what's design strategy? According to the internet, design strategy is the intersection between business profitability and value for people. It helps businesses figure out the question of what to do next. So if that is the case, research can help us not only figure out how to build something right, such as the towers we see here, but it can also help us figure out what to build in the first place. Do we even need a tower? Maybe we need a bridge instead. Without being strategic, you get stuck in the how to build it right rut. Should it be tall, wide? Should it have a flag on top? Maybe it should. We assume people like flags. But figuring out what to build in the first place, this is the sweet spot for user research. Understanding user needs and influencing what product gets made in the first place absolves so much chance for error and failure later on. And while a strategic research team might be influencing a game's concept from its earliest stages of development, strategy can impact so many different levels. Insights captures can, can influence features inside of a game, marketing campaigns, or even UX initiatives such as overhauling a game's onboarding experience. Okay, so I know what you are thinking. If evaluative research is a tentacle and we're talking about eight other things, well, that, ups, that adds up to like nine things. So for now, let's make evaluative research the head, or I guess that would be called the beak. And, uh, and yes, I realize that this is actually a giant squid. But anyways, evalu evaluative research is pretty foundational. It was, it was at least for me and, you know, building the practice and getting a user research program off the ground. But let's walk through the eight other items. And, and as we do, I'll give you some ideas as to why these items are important and how you can start implementing them in your research practice. Tentacle number one. Prioritize discovery. If there's only one thing you do out of all of these eight items, do this one. Why? Well, first of all, discovery research is strategy. Innovation requires going beyond surface level insights. So what's discovery research? Probably you've heard terms like problem space. You've maybe done work like player profiling. Perhaps you've built things like personas. You've done or heard about things like co-creation or cultural probes, experience mapping. In a nutshell, it is the kind of research you do to find things like latent needs and problems that need solving. Now, games are different than things used for utility. So I see discovery research in the world of games as a way to understand how to capture new audiences and influence meaning and mechanics inside of a game by learning about people's lived experiences. Innovation really requires about going to the core. It's about getting to people's inner reasoning, inner thinking, philosophies, emotional reactions, motivations. And doing this kind of work really gets to say like why people might play a game in the first place. It helps us understand the philosophies, 
behind why people might play socially or not. So how do you start prioritizing doing that kind of discovery work, that, that amazing design thinking, design strategy kind of work? First of all, when you have a choice, do a discovery project. When you don't, add discovery to your project. So when you have a choice, run the discovery-oriented project. For example, you might have a couple of research projects that you discuss with your game or product partner, and both have equal weight for priority for some reason or another, such as, you know, your product partner or your game partner says, I know we need to start evaluating the first time player experience to make it better and retain more players, but I also know we are curious about innovating on some social features and we'd like to take a blue sky approach. Kick off the discovery work. The first time user experience work can wait. Sometimes you don't have a choice. You'll talk and talk to your product manager, or, you know, your game, your game designer, and you find out that the, the evaluative work might take priority. So this is when you can start bringing discovery oriented questions into your evaluative projects. You can call this doing the discovery sandwich. Now, a discovery sandwich means that, you know, discovery is the bread, evaluating is the meat and the lettuce and the tomatoes, and then you have some discovery at the end. So let's say your team is working on a new avatar creation experience and user research wasn't involved until after something was built or after something was built. And I can, I can tell you, this is something that happened oftentimes to me. We get involved in a project a little late, but there were still all these discovery and generative oriented questions about like, you know, what, what's appealing to people and, and, and how perhaps to make the avatar experience more inclusive. You can make the case to include discovery oriented questions in your interview guide. For example, what went through your mind the last time you created an avatar? Then, you go through the, the script where they actually use the tool that your team has built to make the avatar. And then at the end, you ask things like, how might what you use today address some of the thoughts you brought up before? All right, tentacle number two, start a listening practice. So a listening practice is a way to get deep insights from players on a rolling basis. So it's actually another way to add discovery and prioritize discovery to your work. So by, by default, it is innately strategic. It's also a way to have a steady flow of insights come in uh, for those really needy artifacts that you dream of building, things like personas or journey maps. But a lot of those kinds of artifacts, they require, they require capturing a lot of deep insights, like doing a lot of user interview work, and that can be re really, um, time time consuming. So a listening practice is a way to add more discovery work to your research and it allows for making time to get that steady flow of insights. So how do you do it? Kick off something called a player listening program. You'll need to work with your dev teams to figure out which players to listen to. You know, if they're current players or players of competitor games, ideally it would be a mixture of both. It's so important to get out of our heads and learn from players of other games or even people who don't yet play games. So what you do is you decide, okay, how often are we going to do player listening? Is it quarterly? Is it monthly? Is it sprintly? You don't need a script. So this makes it easy to do. You simply schedule the sessions and you say to the player that you're talking to, you know, what goes through your mind when you play the game that you want to have them talk about? or maybe a genre of games that you have you want to have them talk about. Listen to what they say and use your innate user research curiosity to get beyond surface level insights. Okay, temple, tentacle number three, test stimuli, not solutions. So eventually you'll get deep into, you know, right before a game is about to launch and sure, you're gonna be testing builds and like versions and things like that, that's normal. But strategy, strategy is time. We can start learning before we build anything. And it's so important for us to start detaching ourselves from our solutions. We start treating our games, our ideas as our babies. And when we do that, 
we limit our, the opportunity to learn and learn about possibilities that might be better. Testing stimuli is simple. You just test other people's stuff, such as art. There are so many interesting ways to get visual and audio stimuli, stimuli from the web. There are libraries with public domain images, such as the ones I'm using in this presentation. And there's tools like Canva that you can use to make mood boards and storyboards. And the other thing you can do as the researcher is you can make the stimuli. Don't wait for your dev teams to make stimuli for you. Take a load off their backs and put some items together that align with your research questions. In this case, perhaps you're trying to understand affinities to female and male dress throughout the ages in order to influence rarity of content in your character creator. All right, tentacle number four, start running workshops. Why? Because workshops are fun. Yeah, I said it, the F word, fun. Honestly, if you work in games and you aren't having fun, you're doing something wrong. Being creative with our colleagues is so invigorating and as a research leader, we should be getting creative with how the teams we support are taking action on taking action on the insights. Okay, so what do I mean by taking action on taking action on the insights? Don't wait around for the game jam. Don't get sad when you aren't invited to the game jam. Run your own game jam, where jamming happens as influenced by the insights you've captured or your team has captured. Start incorporating things like affinity mapping. And I'll be transparent. I was, it wasn't really until I left games and worked in some other industries and then came back and did some freelance work that I realized the value of doing collaborative workshops. For example, genres that stimulate or reference real life or real life hobbies really benefit from de digging deep into those real life hobbies to say like interviews, discovery interviews. You can then work collaboratively and remotely using a tool like Mural or Miro to find themes and patterns. Work with your game designers to decide what kinds of game design lenses you would like to consider as you are doing the mapping. Here I'm showing you some obvious examples that might have been extracted for, say, a farming game. If we had talked to people who love farming or, you know, some light uh, gardening, like growing vegetables. Tentacle number five, design your alignment process. Like, treat your alignment process as a product of itself. Because strategy is approach. If you run a research project using the wrong method, for example, if you ask about usability in the survey, you should have been observing it in the first place, right? You are going to let yourself and everyone else down. More importantly, we have to be asking the right questions in the first place. So I recommend two areas to add some design flair to, those being the creation of strong questions and Drawing from our previous workshop related tentacle, start running alignment workshops. So strong questions tend to have key parts. They should start with a verb. They have some sort of directionality or spatial thing happening. So I'm calling it a vector space. And they help us understand the drivers, you know, who is being driven. And they also help us understand why the question needs to get answered in the first place, like the value to the business, right? So you can make a grab bag of words and verbs and spaces and drivers and who's and what's and why's to help you create really strong questions for your research projects. Might someone want to take this, on, this one on? Discover the totality of experiences when making an avatar so that we can be more inclusive. I think that'd be a great PhD project, perhaps. If you think there are parts missing here, just add them. All you need is more prepositions. This is a beautiful image I found on the internet, and I believe the tool used to create this image was Miro, a tool I have no affiliation with, but have enjoyed using in the past. There's also Mural, I believe Figma now has FigJam. So these are all collaborative whiteboards and they're awesome. And they are tools that I did not use in the past. Um, if you know about my work history, Apologies to, to my entire team that I ever worked with. I, I wish we had had this tool. So typically I would create a slide deck to drive alignment meetings, but a workshop could be more fun and a collaborative way of kicking off user research. It also just helps people think and make sure more voices are heard rather than the user researcher just speaking the whole time during like reading out the deck. 
this kind of puts the, the agency in your stakeholders' hands, right? One downside to collaborative whiteboards is that they are not super accessible to people who use screen readers, so keep that in mind. What I've done here is just I've taken some of the questions um, and the screenshot uh, the, and this user research kickoff canvas, and I've just, you can see here, I've taken some examples of how to make those questions a little more game oriented. You know, if you see the word user, switch it to the word player. Uh, you know, games are a lot about emotions. You know, uh, apps that are utilitarian are a lot about problems to be solved. But for us, we're trying, you know, we're trying to help our game developers create experiences that evoke certain feelings. So those are some things to keep in mind when you find these kinds of uh, product canvases to just to, to shift and rejig the kinds of questions that you're asking. Tentacle number six, schedule weekly insights broadcasts. Okay, so remember back to tentacle, tentacle number two. So I mentioned to start a regular cadence of player listening, but you know, you don't want those insights to just go and die on Confluence or SharePoint or on your hard drive. Consider getting a weekly share out on the calendar. Yes, I said weekly. I can't take credit for this one at all. A recent manager of mine suggested doing this. It was groundbreaking. By getting a dedicated time on the calendar, you save so much time of having to like schedule and work out people's times. You just get it on the calendar. You let everyone know this is the time it's gonna be happening. Move some stuff around. You, you find the time obviously that works the best for everyone. And I promise you'll be able to. So this weekly meeting will be incredibly influential. It will just be strategic by de definition. This is a great way to build trust with the people you're supporting. You will help your developers and game designers um, and UX partners keep the player in mind at a regular cadence. So how do you do it? All you have to do is get it on the schedule. Let's say you have a giant report. You can read out part one, you know, one week and the other part next week without the guesswork of when, you know, part one and part two is happening. This can also be a great time to run a short workshop with the, the insights presented, say like the week. So if you presented insights the week before, let everyone know that next week we're actually gonna get together and do a little more work to really ingest those insights and start using them to be creative and innovative on the game. So looking at the schedule we see here, it seems like I think a fine time present to present might be on Friday after Dr. G.V. McGill presents on the, play, uh, the place of philosophy on modern society. Tentacle number seven, recommend what to do and what not to do. Stop waiting for your product managers to tell you what needs to get researched and make some recommendations. Better yet, make some recommendations for what not to do as well. If I had a nickel for every time I ran a usability study that could have just been an A-B test, I'd probably have like 35 cents. I will be honest, saying no to work is a bit of an art form. But in this case, I'm not completely telling you to say no. No one wants to work with someone, you know, who's super difficult and just turning research down. That's, that's not what I'm advocating for. Rather, I'd recommend just like making, rec I'd recommend saying, hey, like might we approach this question in a different way? You know, A-B testing is a great example. So there may be situation where, maybe situations where you can use a more scalable method, such as simply running an A-B test inside of your game. And certainly this isn't news. Companies have been doing A-B testing for years. The issue that I ran into is that A-B test ownership wasn't really within our user research service. So we had to do some work to leverage the tools available to us and also build relationships with the people who were running the A-B test so that when there was a gray area for like, should this be just a usability study, like an, an unmoderated usability study or just an A-B test that we can run in game, we had some, some people we could work with, we could bring in our co counterparts and we could leverage those tools. Another thing you can start doing is to just listen for assumptions. So you likely won't need this fancy assumption finding radar system because honestly, they tend to just fly around in the air all the time. I've heard things like we know what the player wants because we are the player. Women will like our cooperative mode or here's a list of features already validated by our head of technology as meeting user needs. 
When you hear an assumption, one thing you can say is, what's your thinking on that assumption? Finding assumptions can be a great way to kick off research that could impact success. Because while sunsets are beautiful in nature, they are not beautiful in games. Games fail and get sunsetted for many different reasons, but our responsibility as researchers is to at least call out assumptions when we hear them so that we are not designing with falsehoods in mind. All right, almost there. Tentacle number eight, build learning plans for your research roadmaps. So, Learning plans are great for helping you find overlapping needs across your organization, right? Being efficiency, being efficient, spending a little less money, combining projects so, so that you're killing two birds with one stone. It also helps us prioritize the most impactful work. So let's say you're supporting two different games. One is about drinking milk, as you see on the left here, and one is about, looks like it's about ducks. So if you were like me in the past, you would just bucket milk into one milk bucket, and then you'd bucket ducks into the duck bucket, right? And you just build the roadmaps for each game. You make a separate plan, and perhaps your roadmap would look something like this, a list of projects and vendors or tools, and the quarter at which it's getting made and the cost, but when we do this, we might miss the fact that the audience of milk drinking game really overlaps with the audience of duck jumping game. So to prevent this, start a practice called building a learning plan. I took this one from Leah Buley's um, user experience team of one. I love this template. And so you can do this with each of your teams. But the goal is that you might uncover similar questions. So as you're talking to teams and sort of using this template to understand what you need to uncover, what beliefs your teams have, um, the KPIs are trying to drive. You can then start to realize that maybe there's some overlap. Maybe there's some research you've done in the past. Um, and you can start building your research plans by initiative rather than by game. You can start doing projects that are much more impactful and you can help your team start to see all the possibilities. So what were the tentacles again? So if we said evaluative research, it's kind of the foundation of our research practice. The other eight tentacles are prioritize discovery, start a listening practice, test stimuli, design your alignment process, run workshops, schedule weekly insights broadcasts, recommend what to do and what not to do, and build learning plans for research roadmaps. And I get it, eight is a lot, but you can put on your thinking cap, like our friend right here, and get creative. There's no prescriptive right or wrong, or wrong way to do each of these items, and they don't have to be done all at once. As you take on projects, consider which of these items you could initiate through that project. As researchers, we all want to be impactful. With these items, I hope you can help the teams you support see all the po possibilities, or as I like to say, all the tentacles of the octopus. Thank you. I'd ha be happy to answer your questions, and you can find me on the IGDA Grux Discord. I love talking about user research. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch.